My name is Maria Heglund, and as Dog already mentioned, I'm also the supervisor of Sara Rigare. I might mention her as well. Uh, but I'm a researcher at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. Uh, and very nicely, you, you sort of said that the patient perspective was a very important future research area. And that's what I thought I would talk about today. So I'm not going to get very technical with you, but rather talk about what does the patient perspective mean. Um, I'm actually very happy to be here because I, stu I studied in Uppsala a long time ago and I defended my PhD thesis here in 2009, but at the medical department. But I studied software engineering, uh, starting here at Polaxbacken and then at Economicum, uh, when it was called ADB, Administrative Data Behandling. <laughs> very, very different. Um, and I actually still live in Uppsala, so it's really nice to, to be able to work from home. Um, I also do a lot of teaching at KI. So we have a, a, an e-health MOOC that has been running for, uh, I think it's the third time it's starting now. And it's free. You can sign up. You don't have to complete it. It's open for everyone. Um, just to have a look. We also have a, a global master program in health informatics where I'm the director of studies. It's a two-year master program at KI. Um, and if, I'm very active on Twitter and social media. So you, you can follow me there as well if you're interested. And if you see me fiddling with my phone during presentations, it's not because I'm not interested, it's because I'm very interested. I work at the Health Informatics Center, and that's actually Sara Rigare there, uh, one of our PhD students, where we do uh, needs-driven research focusing on clinical decision-making, integrated patient-centered information systems, and patient participation and empowerment. And we're not a huge research group, as you can see, but we're growing. And we also have a newsletter and seminars. If you ever feel like visiting Solna, you might want to come and, come and seek us out. My own main research focuses are on patient-centered health informatics or participatory e-health, as I sometimes talk about. Uh, but focusing on improving inter-organizational information sharing and collaboration. I've worked a lot in home care with elderly patients and the, the interaction between um, healthcare and social care and patients and family members. But my main passion is probably on in patient empowerment and looking at e-services for patients. So I'm working among all the other things with, you know, what happens when the electronic health record is made available online to patients, how does it affect communication and things like that. But also support for self-management and, and um, other e-services for patients. And I have my background in user-centered design and, and usability, so I have a lot of focus on those issues in my research. <clears throat> and I thought this is probably um, something you're very familiar with, but I thought I'd start with that anyway. The use of human-centered design process, which is standardized and, and well acknowledged. Um, but it gives a good framework, I think, when we talk about patient-centered health informatics as well. Because it states that it's very important to understand and specify the context of use when we're developing IT systems. We need to specify the user requirements, produce design solutions to meet the user requirements, and then evaluate the designs against the requirements in a very iterative approach going back and forth. And if we talk about participatory design, it also, of course, means involving the users a lot at all stages, not just when we're sort of interviewing them and observing them to understand the context of use or when we're evaluating our design solutions, but throughout the development process. And this, of course, is equally important if we're working with designing tools for patients. And in healthcare, we often talk about patient-centered care. Healthcare should be patient-centered, focusing on the patient's needs. And it, it sounds very nice. A happy patient in the middle, surrounded by their healthcare team, and everyone is, is happy and focusing on the patient's needs. But in reality, sometimes it looks more like this. <laughs> There's a, some sort of outline of healthcare providers surrounding the patients, who is honestly quite confused. Healthcare is quite fragmented today. You visit a lot of different, especially if you have chronic conditions and perhaps receive healthcare from many different care providers. So this 
This image of the happy patient in the middle, I think, is we need to better support for patients in order to truly have patient-centered care. And in, in a modern society, I think that we also need to think about how we communicate with patients. Most of us in Sweden have our smartphones with us, but we still get our uh, communication with healthcare sent home to us on paper. And I think we, we need to put more efforts into this. But in order to do so, we need to think about... We use the term patient as if it's, you know, an homogeneous group. So I thought I'd, I'd ask you all, how many in here are patients? A few, maybe four or five arms in the air. And I think that perhaps we don't all identify ourselves as patients. And I think that most people who we identify as patients wouldn't identify themselves as patients either. Because being a patient is stepping into a role when we are communicating with healthcare. That's when we step into the role. Of, but we're all people <laughs> in, the, in the long run. So we need to think about when we're designing tools for patients, who are these patients? Who are these people, these users that we're working with? And I think, especially if we, as I have done a lot, you know, you move in the interdisciplinary areas, looking at social um, care and home care and self-care as well, there are even many words for patient. We talk about patients, clients, consumer, consumer health informatics, uh, citizens, invånare. Um, and I think this... Even the, the, you know, the range of names we used when we talk about patients also indicate that these are... This is not a homogeneous group. This, these are people um, with very different needs and perspectives. And of course, a patient can be someone with a chronic condition, like Parkinson's, like Sara Riggare, who has lived with this condition most part of their lives, who learns a, very, a lot about their condition. But it might also be someone who has broken their leg, on their bike ride to work, who has never been at the hospital before. And it might even be someone who is sick but has not been diagnosed yet. Um, we, we often talk about, you know, Parkinson patients, diabetes patients, but comorbidities are increasingly important and people have more than one condition. A lot of patients are reliant on home care, elderly patients, not just the hospital. Um, and, of course, if we talk about individual citizens, they, we have risk factors. We might not be diagnosed yet, we might not even be ill yet, but we need perhaps health promotion, lose a bit of weight, exercise more. And most of us have family surrounding us who are very much affected when perhaps we are giving a, a severe uh, diagnosis, such as Parkinson's or cancer diagnosis, or, that are also affected by this communication with healthcare. Many patients or family members also become administrators and coordinators of their own care, keeping track of, you know, all appointments and who to communicate what with. And more recently, we have been talking a lot about expert patients, e-patients, patients that are empowered and engaged and know perhaps even more about their conditions than their physicians do. And... As we are all moving on to Facebook and Twitter, and we, we're also living in a much more international world. Patients are traveling, but perhaps even more importantly, communicating and creating communities online with other patients from all around the world. So we need to think about who these patients that we're talking about are. In addition, uh, with this growing e-patient movement, the role of the patient in relation to healthcare is also changing. And we talk a lot of now about patient-centered care or person-centered care, as it is now discussed more and more, and compliance and ad adherence, making sure that patients do the things that the f their physicians tell them to do. Um, but increasingly, there's uh, been movements towards patient participation, patients as an active part in a healthcare team, shared decision-making, involving patients in decisions about what treatments they, they prefer, and participatory medicine. And patient empowerment, I think, is, is growing also when it comes to... When we talk about compliance, compliance might be important, 
but making sure that patients are empowered and able to participate in shared decision making uh, about important parts of their health care. And of course this requires, this empowerment requires that you have the capacity that you want to take the responsibility. Not all patients want to, to engage in shared decision making, but I think an increasingly number will. We need awareness and knowledge and understand that we are allowed to participate in these decision makings and feel that we are able to do so. That's what self-efficacy, uh, the term self-efficacy means. And there's of course lots and lots of research about this in the uh, caring sciences. But I think for us as focusing more on the technical aspects, we need to think about the health information systems and the, the e-health that we are designing. How is this changing role of patients, this need for empowerment impacting on, for example, giving patients access to their electronic health records as part of these movements toward uh, a more engaged and um, involved patient with the right to be involved in their own uh, and have insight into their own care. And how do the, the digital systems, the e-health systems that we develop, how do they impact on patient empowerment? Do we design systems that support current structures who are, which are, to be honest, quite hierarchical between healthcare professionals and patients? Or do they help to, to empower patients in their own lives? And of course, I have the same picture, <laughs> which we already saw from Sara Rigare. Um, and this is a link to her blog if you're interested in finding out more about the type of research that she's doing. So I just thought I'd, I'd read out this quote from Sara. I'm not saying I want more time in healthcare, which you might think when you see the one hour of red dot. Uh, I really don't think I need more time with my neurologist. However, I am saying that healthcare needs to acknowledge the work we patients do in self-care and also start working to make use of our observations for their own knowledge. What can healthcare learn from patients? Just imagine what we could achieve if we started working together as equals with different but complementary areas of expertise. Um, and Sara has done a number of, you know, she develops apps to do uh, finger tapping tests and she adjusts her own medications to reduce the risk of having those experiences that we heard about where you get these off periods when the medication gets too low. How do you adjust that better in your own life? And of course her neurologist he can prescribe medications, but he cannot be there to observe her throughout her daily life. And he will not be interested in, in doing that either. Um, so she told me the other day that when they have their appointments, he, he starts by asking, so how do you take your medications now? And she explains it to them, what her medication regimen is, and he puts it into the medical record. And that's a, a somewhat different way of working in, in a collaboration with your healthcare providers. So how do we understand who the patient is? And this, I, I, um, I borrowed this because I really liked it. It's a, from a recent um, uh, paper in, the, in Jania. Um, well, I think that from a healthcare perspective, we're quite used to focusing on the patient's physiological system. We look at their age and gender and their current and past diagnosis and you know genetics and behavioral risk factors and things like that you know what affects their medical condition um, but we also know that when we start talking about self-care and moving outside <coughs> the, the the hospital walls there are of course a lot of other things that affects uh, a patient's health as well and there's a, a patient's social behavioral characteristics are of course extremely important when it comes to both how we we handle our health-related behaviours, but also if we think about using new technology to support these patients. So our knowledge, our cognitive function, our health and digital literacy, how, used, how, how much do we use technology and how, how much do we, for example, search for information online, our attitudes and motivations, our readiness to change, etc. And if we take yet another step, outside. We can talk about the patient's work system and the patient's work activities which actually encompass a lot of this. 
if we think about the patients as, you know, they're the factors that affect them as a, uh, uh, or us as physical beings, but also the, the tasks we do, the tools and technology that we use to manage our daily lives, um, our social organizational factors, that what environment do we live in? What are our family situations, our work situations? And what kind of activities do we actually need to engage with, both in our daily life, going to work, picking up kids from school, calling our parents, uh, and in managing our illness, in having, taking all these medications, doing the exercise, perhaps necessary rehabilitation activities. And we need to, when we introduce new technology to patients, new devices, asking them to measure more, um, uh, ca capture more data for us in, as researchers and clinicians, we need to think about how does this fit into the patient's work systems and the patient's work activities. Sara and I sometimes talk about the burden of tracking. Sara is, of course, a very active self-tracker and she captures a lot of, of data about herself. But we also need to think about how mu what does this cost in terms of, of um, uh, activities that we need to engage in. And we have been, in order to, to you know, understand different uh, user groups more in detail, we've been working with different approaches. And I realized that, I'm, as I suspected, I'm talking a bit too much, so I'll need to speed up. But we have been working with a, a, a method that we call patient journeys. Uh, and in um, design and in, in uh, um, design science, you work a lot with uh, customer journey mapping when you're designing IT systems for uh, customers. And we've, we've sort of uh, looked at this method and, and we've tried to introduce it when we're working with patients. And we have some publications from different uh, patient groups that we've been working with, stroke patients, lung cancer patients and hip surgery patients. But what we are now also doing is, me and Sara together, we have a, a Vinova funded project called Kronisk Kunskap, where we are looking more at lead patients. And I'm, I'm um, going to tell you a little bit more about what we mean with that. But when we work with the patient journeys, we focus a lot on patients' experiences. Because even if we don't identify ourselves as patients, we probably have had some communication with healthcare, which is actually what patients' experiences are. Um, and we focused a lot on, on uh, we used qualitative uh, methods to, to collect data, interviews and focus groups and observations, and then we, uh, we based this on uh, we look at patient journeys, what happens when you journey through healthcare. And this is just an example, very briefly, from when we work with lung cancer patients. And these are just a few quotes. Um, so it had taken time, but then I was supposed to wait three more weeks for a doctor's appointment so that I could find out what it was when they were done. This was a patient who was waiting to get the results of all the diagnostic procedures. Do I have lung cancer or not? And then I lost it completely. And of course, we're not supposed to give a, a cancer diagnosis over the phone or, but if we don't, ha if the, the, the reason was to wait another three weeks because there was no doctor's appointments until then. And of course, as a patient, if you've gone through these eight, 10 weeks of diagnostic procedures and you're waiting for what is very often a death sentence, you don't feel like waiting three more weeks to have that doctor's appointment. This is another example, but I think the communication between the radiology clinic and thorax is poor. It feels like I have to, this spring when I was receiving treatment that would last until summer, I asked if it could clash with the medication I was getting from the radiology clinic, uh, because this was a patient who had both breast cancer and lung cancer. Uh, the chemotherapy is a drug given for breast cancer too, so they could take each other out. And it turned out that no one told me to stop taking this medicine I was taking every day, and they clashed, and I got pretty ill. And this fragmentation of healthcare, I think, as a patient, you end up in the middle, or you, you, you're lost between chairs very often. And just another quote, it had been three to four months, I think, when they put the needle in my arm for chemotherapy, and then I felt, now I will get better, now I have received help. And I think that using these qualitative 
methods to understand the experiences of patients is very powerful if we want to think about, well, what can we do to help them better? And this is just an example of the lung cancer journey. So quite a quite broad overview that we put together with the, based on the, the, the mappings that we already have from healthcare professionals and we work with that together with the, the cancer patients. And then we actually also use these, um, the journey and the interviews to describe problems that we identified in the patient journey. And these are just a few examples. Um, you know, areas where patients felt that they needed more support. And looking at, well, how can we perhaps come up with ideas for e-services that can help patients in these situations? Um, and this is another quote from a, a patient. I can't demand to have total control of the entire process, but I should at least have as much control so that I can trust healthcare and focus my energy in, on getting well. And I think that this is an experience for many patients undergoing complex treatments is that there are too many times when information is sort of lost between different healthcare providers and you lose your trust in healthcare. And you want to make sure, so you end up, you know, phoning and phoning to make sure that the information has re reached the right person. And it's very exhausting for patients. Um, but that was just one example. And now, since I know I'm running out of time, I will just mention briefly um, what we're looking at now. Because those patients that we were working on looking at the journey mappings, they were just, you know, re regular patients, lung cancer patients. Um, but I mentioned these lead users that we sometimes talk about in, in design. Uh, and we, we are looking for lead patients. And I think Sara Rigari is one <laughs> excellent example of what we mean when we talk about lead patients. It's users or patients that face a need that will be general in a marketplace, but face it months or years before the bulk of the marketplace encounters them. So many patients today are perhaps not as, um, active as Sara in, in measuring her own data and, and uh, you know, doing her own app development. But perhaps in the future, a lot more patients will be interested in doing these things. And lead users are positioned to benefit significantly by obtaining a solution to their needs. So they are uh, ahead of time. And of course, Sara is not the only example. These are a few from the US, Hugo Campos, who's um, a man with a heart condition who had a uh, the fibrillator implanted in his heart and he wanted to know he wanted to have access to the data from his defibrillator to understand more about his illness um, and he he wasn't allowed to so he hacked it himself um, and this is Dana Lewis who has had diabetes since she was 13 I think 14 um, who together with her husband designed an artificial pancreas, uh, which is open source and used by a lot of patients in the US now. So there are these patients who are not waiting, who are taking, you know, things into their own hands. And I think that we would be unwise not to uh, collaborate with them and make use of their ideas and their energy because they are the ones who have most to gain from the digitalization of healthcare. And if we return to the user or human-centered design process, I think that, you know, for understanding and specifying the contents that we use, we need to look much more at the patient experience. And journey mapping might be one tool, but there are tons of others out there. I think when it comes to designing, producing design solutions, we should work a lot more with these lead patients. And, of course, do proper usability testing with real patients once we are have our designs in order. But that was it. And we have one minute. <laughs>